The virtue of Christian courtesy. Yes, it's called the virtue of Christian courtesy. Um, I should just do that. Paul, though firm as a rock to principle, yet ever presented or pre yet ever preserved his courtesy. He was zealous for the vital points and was not regardless of the grace and politeness due to social life. The men of God did not absorb the men of humanity. Letter 25, 1870. Some persons speak in a harsh, uncourteous manner that wounds the feelings of others and then they justify themselves by saying, it's my way. I always tell just what I think. And they exalt in its weak, this wicked trait of character as a virtue. Virtue. Their, no, their uncourteous department should be firmly rebuked. The Review and Herald, September 1st, 1885. Um, you know, I kind of came to, I, I, I've got, I've got, I've, oh, I've grown to understand now how to speak the truth to people. Yeah, I know it's, I want to tell people the truth, but there is a way that you say it to them, they are more likely to listen because of the way you approach them. Sometimes it's not, they're not offended because you tell them the truth. Sometimes it's how you say it, because how you say the truth is can be good or bad. I'm okay. Telling the truth is always good, but how you say the truth sometimes can be good or can be bad. It can lead to Christ, or it can pull further away from Christ. And I, I kind of learned that from my from a friend of mine. She is Catholic. That's how I kind of learned how to not say certain things. I will tell her the truth, but I will be mindful of where she comes from, where she comes from, and do my best to avoid uh, saying it in a in a manner in a manner that can turn her off from the truth. Unless she doesn't like the truth at all, but if she does, I mean, I, I'm not too sure if she hates the truth or not. But what I've come to understand is sometimes when I say something to her, she might take it personal when I'm just talking in general. And I've I kind of learned to play around with and not just say it up front because sometimes that might actually lead to a more distancing from God. So let us, let us not forget that part. Yeah, there is a way to actually do these things as well. Oh, uh, yeah. I went too far down. Okay. We are here. The author called... So... The author called to meet every phase of fanaticism. Um... In 1844, which is the last year of the prophetic 2,300-day prophet, uh, prophecy, in 1844, we had to meet fanaticism on every hand, but always the word came to me. A great wave of excitement is an injury to the work. Keep your feet in the footprints of Christ. I was given a message to meet every phase of fanaticism. I was introduced to show the people that under a wave of excitement, a strange work is done. There are those who improve the opportunity to bring in superstitions. Thus the door is closed to the promulgation 
of sound doctrine. Huh. Letter 17, 1902. And that's, um, this is something that's interesting because sometimes, you know, um, sometimes what can happen is people try to, to shut down certain things because of the, the bad things that are happening. But then, that also shuts down the, how do I say that? The instrument to bring in the good one, the good things. And a classical example right now I'm going to say is, I'm not going to make it, I'm going to take it in a secular approach right now. Now we have women. Mm, women are or not getting married anymore as they used to before and um, what we've what we've seen is in the past decades I mean marriage has declined significantly and I think it was in in the 1950s it was 72 percent and then in 2005 it was 48 percent something like this if I don't remember but if I'm wrong Go, you can look it for yourself anyway, so. Uh, let me see, how was that, okay. So what happened was, we have that feminism thing, or girl power movement, or womanism, as you call it now. That's been teaching women a bunch of lies, and women have bought into it. And what happens is, a lot of those bad women, that are teaching false narratives to younger women, that are deceiving, and bringing them delusions, these women are now, men are now talking about them, those kind of women, and, prove, and hoping that other men will not get trapped with a, 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 a womanism, woman type. But what that also does, the good women that are looking for a, a great husband, they are now shut down as well because men are just not wanting to take the risk anymore. Not only that, if you think about it, now we have the court system, the justice system against men. Men are the one um, being, when, the, when divorce happens, the man is guilty until proven, until proven, proven you know, innocent. If something bad happens and they blame a man, then he gets arrested, even though the woman lies. So all of these things now going on makes men now no, no longer wanting to be around women. Now, guess, guess who is paying the price? It's not just the, the bad women. It's all women now. And some of the women are saying, well, I'm not like this. I'm not like that. But us men, what we say is, well, if you're not like this, why don't you speak against it? Why don't all the good women out there, why don't you go and make do a rally against these evil women? So if you, can, if you don't do that in a sense, what we as men we are thinking is, you are just part of them too. And that's exactly what this is right now. He's actually talking about in a sense. I'm taking what happened into 19, 1844 and bringing it into a secular aspect of today. The, they tried to shut down the bad thing, but at the same time, the good thing now also get also getting shut down. Why? Because they lumped all of them together. And that's what happened here. The strange excitement is done. That means you, it's no longer being pushed into the public. But also the good doctrine is no longer being pushed to the public. And that's what happened. The bad women have done their damage. So now men are being more cautious, cautious about women. And the good women are now also being lumped into all the women in general and we get this chaos right now so i hope that makes sense 
if you didn't get it from the spiritual perspective, I, I hope that me bringing it into, the, into our time to make it more make make it more contemporary I hope it makes sense now for you to see what I'm talking about so let's move on an impending danger let's see an impending danger hmm as the end draws near the enemy will work with all his power to bring in fanaticism among us he would rejoice to see people like me, Seventh-day Adventists, going to such extremes that they would be branded by the world as a body of fanatics. Against this danger, I am bidden to warn ministers and lay members. Our work is to teach men and women to build on the true foundation, to plant their feet on a plane, thus saith the Lord. Gospel Workers 3.16 Actually, we did get branded, we did get brand extremists because we were teaching the Bible principles of the mark of the beast. That the beast in, in the principal form is the papacy. Not Catholic people, not God, not Catholic. The system called the papacy. And of course, the image of the beast is, which is the United, the United, the United States of America, and because we were preaching that, which is what the Bible actually preaches, they labeled us extremists. There's another way we were also being labeled extremists. I think it is another way as well, because you see, most of the churches out in the world that are so-called Christians. Um, they all keep the spurious Sabbath, which is Sunday, which is the fourth Sabbath. And they also preach that um, you can eat whatever you want to eat. Yeah. Because they like to misinterpret the book of Acts chapter 10, where God told Peter to arise, kill and eat. But what they do is they stop in verse 17 and they don't read all the way to verse 41. So they just take it out of context to make their own, um, for their own destruction. As Peter said it in second, in second Peter chapter 3 verse 15. So, because us Seventh-day Adventists, we don't eat, um, pork, we don't eat horse, we don't eat l lobster, crab, and all this nasty stuff that people eat. And of course, we didn't either at that time celebrate the pagan holidays like Christmas, Halloween, Easter, and Mother's Day and all these things. So we were labeled as extremists. So what did our people do in the general conference? That's the true story. At least in the U.S., I don't know about my country. I'm sure you can see my country from the, from the, from the flag. I don't know in my country because when I was there, we didn't have any of that. But here in the U.S., I've, I can see that there was a compromise, a big compromise, and we decided to celebrate Christmas and Easter, Easter and Halloween, so that we can look more appealing to the world and that is basically um, bad so we we basically breached the yeah. I have to say it because it's true so that's that yeah. okay I'm gonna read I think we're almost done with the chapter yeah mind control one form of fanaticism. I have spoken distinctly regarding the dangerous science which says that one person shall give up his mind to the control of another. This science is the devil's own and that's exactly what the papacy is trying to do with that all common good 
and all that thing. This is basically saying you are not supposed to have your own free will. You have to be subjective to the global evil demise, basically. This is the character of the fanaticism we have to we had to meet in 1845. I did not I did not then know what it meant, but I was called upon to bear a most decided testimony uh, against anything of this kind of the kind. Letter third three hundred um hundred and thirty A nineteen oh one. So if you think of that, of the common good, uh, we need to come together as one people and have one, a new world order and all these things. Yeah, that's what the music is talking about. Having somebody control your mind instead of you controlling your own mind. Yeah, that, that now we kind of know what it is. And we are at the end. Last paragraph, guys. Last paragraph to finish this chapter. Cherish an impartial, optimistic outlook. There is no reason for us to fix our eyes upon error, to grieve and complain, and lose precious time and opportunity in lamenting the faults of others. Would it not be more pleasing to God to take an impartial outlook and see how many souls are serving God and resisting temptation and glorifying and honoring Him with their talents of means and, inte and intellect? Would it not be better to consider the wonderful miracle working power of God in the transformation of poor degraded sinners who have been full of moral pollution who become so transformed that they are Christ-like in character. Letter 63, 1893. So, what we are learning is, and this is something I think we've been we've been learning the wrong way. When somebody sins, we like to look at that person in a down, down way, down. Um, we look at them. We look down on them. Um, and when some and to, and this is the this is why I just don't understand sometimes. When somebody gets divorced and gets remarried, we make it seem like this is the the worst sin ever. I just don't understand that part. Now I'm not encouraging anybody to go di get divorced and remarried. No. But I, I, I can't look down on someone who does that. I, I just can't. And I, I, and I will not. Because I've known people that, have, that were married. And apparently she wanted to have kids. And the man would not give her a kid. Well, guess what? She divorced the guy. And then she got remarried. And now she has two children. Should she stay in the marriage while she's unhappy? I don't know. How, how was it before they got married? I don't know. But if she divorces the man, well, of course, that's why we know that 80% of divorce anyways is done by women nowadays, so it's not a surprise. Hopefully not to you. It's not to me either anyways. And it... And if the woman, of course, divorces the man and gets remarried, and now she's having a good life that she kind of she always wanted, why would I look down on her for divorcing her first husband? You know? Yeah, I know she did something bad, but that's not the worst sin for me to look down upon her for that. And I think that's the one thing that we've done in our in our church, actually, actually in my church as well. Um, that we, if we know you sinned, then you just not. Uh, it's like he committed. It's, like, it's as though you committed. It's as though you committed the the worst crime ever. I don't get it, but people do that. Anyways, 
So that was the chapter, guys. That was the chapter entitled The Fanatical Mind. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we become much better people in the mindset as well as in a physical way. I hope that we we do appreciate what we have and keep God's word in front of our eyes that we only see Jesus Christ and not become fanatics and go extreme um, either in the good way or in the bad way. But hopefully we don't go extreme at all. But we just keep our mind focused on Christ in the good way and stay there until Christ comes the second time. So, guys, this was Mario Michel. Um, and I thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to, to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Also, don't forget to follow and like my page on Facebook. And you're going to see it in the, in the screen below. So, I hope to see you guys again. But if I don't see you guys again, I hope to see you guys when Jesus comes the second time. Yes, in heaven. Until then, bye for now. Mario out.